morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So good to see all of you gathered here on this December 1st morning. Can you believe it's December 1st? Wow. Did all of you have something to be thankful for over Thanksgiving? Ah, great. That's great. Me too. Just a few things. So several announcements this morning. Uh, Sarah, do you want to start off? Good morning. I have all kinds of fun stuff today. Um, you'll notice in your bulletin there's a purple um, insert, and this is a poem, and it's going with our Advent theme for this year, What Can't Wait. And every week there will be a different poem, and you're just invited to bring it home, read it throughout the week, put it on your fridge, read it if the sermon starts going too long and you're looking for... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, did she did she say that? <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing is on the table in the back is an Advent devotional. We've printed about 60 of 60 or 70 of these I think and it's again it's just something that you can take home. It has a devotional for every day starting today throughout Advent and Christmas. Um, if we run out, we will print more and get them to you as soon as possible. And then finally for our uh, families with younger children or even older children, we have an Advent calendar that you can pin up on your fridge, and it gives you just something to do each day during the season of Advent. And these are in the office, or I can find you with one after church. Can older people do it without children? Yes. And same thing, if we run out, we can definitely make more. That's good. That's a good call. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. And then we have the PW Luncheon that's coming up, and that'll be December 5th at 1130 a.m. And this is the annual Christmas luncheon when all of the Presbyterian women from this region come together from Fairfield and Minneapolis and all those other places. And so it's a, it's a fun time, and they have a special program. So you are welcome to join us for that on December 5th. And the social justice class will be meeting today. They are still talking about the election process. And so you can meet in the fellowship hall after worship to, to go in and talk about the election process. And December 8th, we have one of my favorite things, one of my many favorite things, that is uh, take away hunger. And that's when we do the meal packaging, when we package about 10,000 bags of food. It's, it's rice and protein powders and uh, vitamin powders and we seasoning and we put them all in these little packages and we send them off to places that are impacted by hunger or disaster. And so uh, we would love to have as many people as possible sign up and come down. You don't even have to sign up. We'll find a place for you, but it takes a whole team. Uh, to do it, and we line up people to tables, throw on some music, and really have a good time packaging those meals. So that'll be next Sunday, December 8th. And then I believe Peggy Frank is going to say something about Christmas cards. Good morning. Um, the Deacon Committee would like to thank all of you for your generous donation for two cents a meal. Um, with that contribution of yours it goes into a deacon fund and then we distribute it to camp wyoming fellowship cup tulsa community action battered women and sometimes we hear of individuals or families or the church gets a phone call that somebody needs um, some extra help and thanks to you we are able to say yes we can help you but in december we don't collect the two cent a meal we do the Christmas card project, which means that instead of sending individual Christmas cards to your Presbyterian friends, uh, you donate the cost of the cards and the money, and then on December 22nd, your name will appear in a special insert in the bulletin. But uh, we need your donation by December 18th. So this will be in the office, and um, just sign your name, put your donation in, and we thank you for your generosity. Uh, last year, we collected $500 for the Christmas card project, so thank you very much. Thanks, Peggy. 
Uh, I just wanted to announce that those of you who are going to be readers during Advent and Christmas, remember we want to just run through this right after the service today. So if you would stay, we'll get that done in a brief amount of time. Thank you. So right after, right after worship, you'll, you'll do the reading. And then the coffee line will go down. And then you won't have to wait for cookies. Just a few more announcements. We're having a Christmas potluck December 15th after the lessons and carol service. So I know that we have a lot of programming going on that day with the school and all that. We always run into that conflict year after year. So stay, get some lunch, and then go do all the stuff you have to do. Yeah, so potluck. It's the reason why I, I went to church in college. We, we would figure out what church was having a potluck what day. And, and that's how we just stay fed. And then we have the other, another great tradition, and that's the memorial poinsettias. Uh, so you can contact the church office if you would like to have a, a poinsettia displayed after or for the Christmas service, and you can uh, sign up to, to do those in honor of a loved one or in memoriam of a loved one. And then finally, we are doing the Heifer Project uh, for our Christmas joy offering this year. So every year we take a Christmas joy offering, and traditionally that offering goes to help retired ministers and their spouses stay in the Presbyterian homes. Well, this year we had a special incentive to switch things up and to do the Heifer Project because Heifer International, the, the animal project, they are doing a matching funds campaign right now where um, they have $1.4 million to match anything that's given. And so the church has given $2,000 through our mission offerings, and, and then we are seeking to raise even more to, to go ahead and have those funds match. So the kids on Wednesday are gathering funds, and the Press On kids are gathering funds, and so we would encourage you as members to, to participate as well. And you can see... On, on the bullets in there, how much it costs to do a sheep, how much it costs to do a goat, how much it costs to do a whole cow. Maybe we could do a whole ark, which is $5,000. The um, idea that, that we want to do is that instead of Christmas, the Christmas joy offering, that we will culminate this as uh, the heifer offering this year. And so this, this will be our big campaign for, for the Christmas season. Um, we would like you to make the checks out to the church so that we can have a total of what was given uh, to the to the Heifer International through the church so that we can we can count that and let you know how much we all raised together, if that makes sense. So you can, if you want to do a sheep or a goat, you can delineate that on there and we can do a little picture. Like someone asked, well, I want this to go to like my grandkids to tell them I got a goat in their name. We can give you the little card that has the picture of the goat on it to give to them that says this was done in your honor. So we can still do that if you want to do something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Okay, are there any other announcements today? All right, let us center our hearts and minds to, to worship God. What if God had waited for Mary to be wed, for Herod to relent, for a legitimate birthing bed? What if God had waited until the powerful promoted peace and the politicians agreed? What if God had waited for a plan with no risk of failure, for a place that felt safe and secure? What if God had waited for the anxious to find rest, for the cynic to know hope, for the brokenhearted to be whole, for the wars to cease, for the violence to end, for the fears to pass, for the weapons to be banned? What if God had waited for the earth to heal, for the laws to change, for every life to matter the same, for the addict to be freed from shame, for the refugees to not be blamed. What if God had waited 
until all was calm, all was bright, for a future that might never come. What if God had waited? But God couldn't wait. God couldn't wait to be love known in flesh and bone, and neither should we. I will wait for coffee to brew. I will wait for traffic to clear. I will wait for fruit to ripen. I will wait for flowers to grow. I will wait for seasons to change. I will wait for the sun to rise. I will wait for you to say sorry. I will wait for the doctor to call. I will wait for the weekend to arrive. I will wait for my baby's first words. I will wait for Christmas to arrive. I will wait for a lot of things, but I will not wait for hope. I cannot wait for hope, because I want to live with hope today and every day. I want to roll my sleeves up and get to work, living, serving, giving, and transforming with the hope of a better day. So today, we light the candle of hope as a reminder and as a prayer that we might stop waiting and start living, stop watching and start moving. May the light of this candle burn inside us this week, inspiring hope and action for God's promised day. Amen. Now let us stand as we are able for the call to worship. Hope is gravity for the broken. Hope is manna in the wilderness. Hope is seeing stars in the city. Hope is the anthem of faith. So come to this place with your hopes and your fears. Let us worship Holy God.
please be seated and join me in the prayer for forgiveness. Gracious God, you paint a picture of a better world, a world of peace and joy, of equality and grace. But we turn our heads and close our eyes, afraid that you might want us to help. You ask us to be brave, and we are complacent. You ask us to speak out, but instead we stay quiet. You ask us to listen, and we assume we are the experts. You lead with love, and we wait on the sidelines. Forgive us for always being ten steps behind you. Forgive us for all the ways we are works in progress. Fill our hearts with a hope that won't let go. Gratefully we pray. Amen. Let us continue to confess our personal sins in silence. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The past is left behind. Everything has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Through Jesus Christ, we have called as friends, forgiven as sinners, and sent back out as servants. Thanks be to God for this good news. Today's Bible lesson is from Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together. To it the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For there the thrones of judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, 
peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. The word of the Lord. second lesson for today comes from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. 
and days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Words of hope, words of wisdom. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, as we dwell on these words from thousands of years ago, words of hope, words of wisdom, help us remember today and help us take up action today for those things that can't wait. Help us to live into this hope not only in word, but also in deed. Help us to shine forth your light, which is still streaming and coming into our world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we are not doing Advent the same way this year. Advent is traditionally a time of waiting. We wait for Christ the Messiah to be born. We wait to celebrate the birth of Jesus in the manger, and we wait for the coming of peace. Advent waiting helps us to recall why we need hope, love, joy, and peace. Traditionally in Advent, we read some of the apocalyptic texts, and it throws people off. They expect to hear stories of a baby and think of swaddling, cuddly things. But instead, as you'll see in the coming weeks, we get a little bit of <clears throat> gloom and doom. But that is to remind us of why, why we wait for this child. However, this Advent, we are doing things a little differently. Instead of waiting and talking about waiting this Advent, we are going to talk about what can't wait. A writer who helped put together this worship series from a group called Sanctified Art meditated on this story of Christ's birth, the precarious timing of it. And here is what one of the writers shared. God chooses an unwed, lower-class teenage girl forced to travel cross-country to be counted for the, for the census in the midst of her third trimester. Matthew's Gospel tells us that Christ's birth incites King Herod to mandate a mass genocide where thousands of innocents were slaughtered. Mary, Joseph, and Jesus were forced to flee to Egypt for refuge. God's plan to enter the, the world in human flesh seems so perilous. So much could and did go wrong. And this led the writers to wonder, what if God had waited? What if God had waited for some perfect day when all of the world's problems were resolved? What if God had waited for a perfect moment in time or for the perfect family? But God couldn't wait. God didn't wait. God dove into the mess and the muck of this world so that we might know love. 
in the same way. We can't sit around and wait for our world's problems to solve themselves. We can't assume that a perfect moment or a fail-proof plan will emerge if we just hold out long enough. We can't wait to join God in making love known and flesh and bone. These texts from Isaiah today speak of God's promised day that we have all been waiting for. A day when all wars will end. A day when swords are beaten into, into plowshares and spears become pruning hooks. Walter Brueggemann says of this passage from Isaiah, it is a vision, an act of imagination that looks beyond present dismay through the eyes of God to see what can be, to see what is not yet. Now, the city of Jerusalem in the time of Isaiah was under siege. It was under economic and, and pressure from all of the bigger countries around it, from Babylon, from Egypt. It was marginal and vulnerable. It lived and flourished or suffered at the behest of the great powers surrounding it. And against that present shabbiness, as Brueggemann writes, the poet who wrote Isaiah imagines a majestic future for the city. In the poem, though, is not an active anticipation of triumph for Jerusalem as a war machine. In fact, it is completely opposite. Isaiah challenges the leaders of Jerusalem to put down their weapons of war. And he says, take care of your poor and your elderly and your children within your own walls. For the more you prepare to fight Babylon, the more you crumble inside yourself. The poet's vision is a profoundly theological vision that is fixed on hope and God's peace, where he says, when your neighbors do well, you do well. So he encourages them, instead of fighting the neighbors, to build them up to work with them. The poem then offers a lyrical vision of an alternative economy and the dismantling of the weapons of war. It is, a not, it is not enough to just smash spears and swords as a romantic, idealistic action of goodwill. But those swords spears are smashed to usher in a new way of being. They become instruments of life, such as plowshares and pruning hooks. Listen to what happens when they no longer build themselves up for war, but build themselves up for the purpose of helping one another. The economy is transformed. The earth is transformed from battleground to fertile garden. And this is all done through God's vision of peace, of hope, of what can be. Isaiah envisions a world where warring nations convert their weapons into tools for flourishing. I read an essay recently from a TED Talk blog. I love TED Talks. Uh, and in this TED Talk blog, this author, a businessman, an entrepreneur, an industrialist, built 10, 10 machines that could help a city completely sustain itself. 10 machines under $10,000, and he put together 30 people right down south of us in Missouri to live in a village with, these, with only these 10 machines, and they've been doing a project for three years. 
where they end up with clean water, they end up building homes, they end up being able to uh, make materials out of clay and dirt, they can make windows, they can make heat, they can make electricity, all with these tin machines, and it becomes this completely self-sustaining community. And, and in this article, he said, there is this myth of capitalism and supply and demand where we no longer need those things. We have enough knowledge, industry, production to where we could provide for every single person, 7 billion people on this earth, if we would just do so. And that this myth that people won't work if things are provided for them is just that, a myth. It turned out that the people were more productive than when they wouldn't have to worry about things like clean water or illness or food or shelter, that they did things they were actually passionate about. They became more innovative and they produced more. And he shared this vision saying, this is how the world could be. It is right there in front of us if we would just start doing it. And he said, it's that easy. It's too idealistic, I know. Isn't it, though? Isn't it just silly? Oh, Trey, you don't understand the way economics works. That will never happen in this world. But that's what Isaiah was saying right there. Listen, stop these weapons of war and create tools for life. It's an amazing vision. I read, read a great essay that talks about how people start to live into these visions, into these visions of hope, about living into things that can't wait. And it's by uh, the Reverend Victoria Safford. And it's a, a, the, the title of the essay is just beautiful. It's called The Small Work and the Great Work. The impossible will take a little while. How to persevere with hope in troubled times. Isn't that just a great title? I mean, that's all you have to read, and you're like, wow, this is going to be good. So she considers, to start the essay, what motivated the men and women who marched in the first LGBTQ parade 40 years ago. She considers what motivated them to do that, to march in a parade. What beyond courage and imagination? And Safford, who's a bit of a poet, channels what these visionary marchers might tell us today, saying, once you have glimpsed the world as it might be, once you have a vision of the world as it ought to be, as it is going to be, it is impossible to live compliant, and complacent anymore in the world as it is. And so you come out and walk and march the way a flower comes out and bloom because it can do no other thing. It has no other calling. It has no other work. And she writes, I am so interested in what Seamus Haney calls the meeting point of hope in history where what has happened is met by what we now make of it. I have a dear friend named Latanya Hall, who is one of those people who took a vision of the world as she saw, she took a vision of the world how she saw it should be. And she started to make it happen. She was one of those people who lived in that in-between place of what is supposed to be and what is not yet. And she started making that vision a reality. She was released from prison in 2009 in Chester, South Carolina. An African-American woman and when she got out, she found that she could not find a place to live. She could not get a job. Her family did not want much to do with her because of her past with the drug abuse and the physical abuse and the domestic violence. And that she was literally on her own, released from prison with nothing 
but her own mind and resources. And she quickly found herself caught up with the only people that would take her in, vagabonds, other drug dealers, people who wanted her to go right back into that old lifestyle that got her in prison in the first place. And she had a vision that this is not the way it should be. That the women getting out of that women's prison in Chester, South Carolina, should find a community, a friend, when they get out. Someone who will help them with resources, with housing, with jobs, with education. And she came to my office one day, and she sat down with me, and she said, Pastor Trey, I have a vision. I want to start a women's shelter. And I've even got the name. The Lord gave me the name when we were in church on Sunday morning, and it's called Battered But Not Broken. And I said, oh, you know, that's, that's great. You know, do you, do you have, what do you have? And she pulls out a scrungy book of notebook paper. And her whole business plan was about a half a page. I said, do you, do you have a budget? Do you have a board? Do you have your nonprofit license? Do you have anything besides you want housing for women, you want food, you want education? And she said, no, that's why I came to you. I want money. <laughs> Ten years later, they just celebrated their 10-year anniversary. She has a home called the Magdalene House. She herself graduated from Colorado State University with a, with a degree in social work. They are meeting women while they're still in prison and starting a relationship with them. And then if they fit the program, they're bringing them out. They're letting five of them stay in the Magdalene House, and then there's more within a community house that they get together with. And they're helping these women start a new way of life. And she sees this vision where these women become empowered, educated, and powerful, where recidivism ends, where they don't go right back into prison, but where they become change agents in their community, in their families, and for their own lives. Now, I know... When Tammy sat down with me, I was discouraging. And she could see it in my face. And she knew it. But I said those words to her, which I've said to so many of you. She said, Pastor Trey, can we do this? And I said, yes. Can we change the world? Yes. Now how? There are things that can't wait. Not all of us are called to be Tammy Hall and work with uh, Latanya Hall and work with people coming out of prisons. But we are called to stand at the gates of hope and to say, we see a vision of what God's world is supposed to be like. And we can't wait for that vision for some perfect day to live into it. We are called to do it now. And we stand wherever we are, whether it's as teachers working with kids, as doctors in a hospital, as nurses, as therapists, as, as leaders in our fields where we work, as, as farmers standing in the midst of corn and soybeans, working with young men, we stand and work. We work for the vision that God has given us where all people are treated with dignity and respect. It's different for all of us. But we know that we are beckoned by God to live in a better way. So in this season of Advent, as we start to celebrate and as we start to wait for Christmas and family and presents and joys, 
remember and wonder together. What are some things that we can't wait for? We know we can't wait for hope. May God bless these words for our hearing, the building up of our lives, and how we live together in all things. In Christ's name, amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith printed in your bulletin. What is the mission of the church? The life, death, resurrection, and promised coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His life as man involves the church and the common life of men. His service to men commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all the sufferings of mankind so that it sees the face of Christ and the faces of men in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on man's inhumanity to man and the awful consequences of its own complicity and injustice. In the power of the risen Christ, and in the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of man's life in society 
and of God's victory over all wrong. The church follows this pattern in the form of its life and in the method of its action. So to live and serve is to confess Christ as Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, this table represents a vision of what is to come, of what is coming, and what is here. It is a table where all people are welcome to share in the body and the blood of Christ, where none are turned away, where everyone is fed, and where all hunger is ended. Friends, everyone is welcome to participate in this vision, to remember a day when there will be no more pain, no more tears, but the world will know true peace. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Most holy God, we remember your son, Jesus Christ, who gave all so that we might live fully. We remember his ways with the outsider, with the vulnerable, with the women who were cast out, with the men who strove for strength and power over love and grace. And we remember that Christ was humble with them, became a servant to them, and showed them a different way of being in life. We thank you that he was willing to die for their and our sins so that we might learn to live in his way. So we thank you for his light in our lives. We pray, O oh Lord, that you pour out your gifts upon this bread and this wine and this juice so that it may become to us the body and blood of Christ, that it may empower us to be Christ-like in all of our endeavors, to usher in the kingdom of God here and now. For we know in these troubled times that cannot wait. Most holy God, we pray today for, for all of our dear friends and families, giving you thanks for the time that we have had over Thanksgiving to break bread with those we dearly love. We pray for those who struggle uh, with illnesses, with disease, with conflicts. We pray, O oh Lord, that where miracles may happen, they may happen, and that you can work wonders in our lives beyond all we ever dream or hope. We ask all of these things in Christ's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. We proclaim to this day that it is a mystery that something that was broken can make us whole. In the same way, Christ took the cup and he poured it out and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It is my blood shed for the forgiveness of all sin. Drink this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim my death and my way of life until I come again. This is the feast of God for the people of God. All is ready. Will the ushers please come forward?
cup of salvation. Join me in prayer. Strengthen us, O God, in the power of your Spirit through this gift of bread, wine, juice, that we may be people who can usher in your kingdom now, that we can bring good news to the poor, lift blind eyes to sight to loose the chains that bind and claim your blessing for all people. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory when we shall feast with all of your saints in perfect hope and joy. In Christ's name, amen. Let us pray.
friends, go out from this place and look for the things that can't wait. Look for the places where God's love must be shown, where God's light must shine, where people need to be shaped, and where we need to be shaped in our own lives so that the kingdom of God is known here and now to all and through all. Let's go from this place with the love of God, with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit being known through you and to you now and forever. Amen. Thank you.